We're going to be speaking about a nobody that wants to bring everybody to Jesus. Our text is going to be in John 1. It's re- the text is really from 29 to 42, but I'm going to start reading in verse 35. If you've got your Bibles and can open them there. Verse 35. And again, the next day after John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. And then Jesus turned and saw them following and said unto them, What seek ye? And they said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted master, where dwellest thou? And he said unto them, Come and see. And they came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. Now one of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon and said unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus, and when Jesus beheld them, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is an interpretation, a stone. Pray with me. Father God, we just thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, for your love, your mercy, your goodness, your faithfulness, Lord, your protection. I could go on and on, God, about how good you are. But this morning, I just ask that the Holy Spirit overshadow this sanctuary and overshadow this messenger, Lord, as we bring forth this message. In Jesus' name we pray according to your word, your will, and your purpose. Amen and amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. A lot of times we get involved with what a great ministry we have. And there's nothing wrong with a great ministry. But Andrew didn't have a great ministry. He was one of the 12, but he was only mentioned 13 times in the Bible. And we've had great preachers and teachers like Billy Graham, John Wesley, Jonathan Edwards. I could go on. But there's a great ministry in the kingdom of God that we need to address today. And it's saints like Andrew that are willing to do what God has called them to do. There was a uh, musician, Leonard Bernstein, or Bernstein, depending on which way you want to say it. Anyway, he had, they asked him, what was the most difficult instrument that you had finding a place to fill? What is that one thing? He thought for a moment, and he said... I get plenty of first violinist, first chair, but I can't find anyone to play second violinist with enthusiasm and a desire to please and a desire to support. Everybody wanted to be first chair, not second chair. Andrew loved Jesus so much, and he was the first to go out and bring somebody to Jesus in the Bible. And you know who that was? That's Peter. Now, he brought him to Jesus, and Peter became one of the chosen three. Peter, James, and John. That's all you hear, right? But Andrew's still behind the scenes working. Do you want to be an Andrew today? Do you want to be somebody that just brings people to Jesus? Doesn't matter whether they know your name. Doesn't matter if they know what you do. Doesn't even matter if they recognize you on the street. One of the greatest compliments I get is when I go to a store and somebody looks at me and says, you used to have a TV program, but I don't remember your name. And I say, that's all right. I don't even tell them my name. But they say, I remember that you talked about Jesus. You see, that's what it's all about, people. It's not about who you know. It's about whom you know. It's about who you're bringing them to. God doesn't put us together like that. He wanted forever, Andrew said, to stay in the background. He did what he needed to do. 
There was a humble pastor that, whose name few people remember even. He served in a little church, got a few souls that came. But year in and year out, the work became more and more discouraging to him. You know, a pastor has a heart for people. And our pastor's heart is to see this entire church filled this entire church of people that are seeking God. And it was only years later that this faithful minister found great joy in the knowledge that one of those he had won to Christ was one of the greatest preachers of all time, Charles Spurgeon. You see, if he hadn't have continued in his vineyard, if he hadn't have continued to work, we'd not have the sermons from Spurgeon that we have today. We'd not have those uplifting comments. People, you never know who God is going to use. You never know what God is going to do. I look at our young people. I don't know where they'll be in 10 years, but I do know a God that does. And our job is to train them. Our job is to keep them here in church. Because for God's work to go forward, we've got to have Andrews. We've got to have people that want to bring someone to Christ. It's number one, follow the leader. Who did Andrew follow? Why did he leave John the Baptist? What do you think? He saw something in Christ. He heard something in that teaching that he desired. Do you have that in, that in you? Do you desire to express Christ to the world? Can people tell that you have been with Christ? When we, we, he was a student of John the Baptist. He was a servant. You know, a servant... Is someone during this 10 weeks of summer, of summer um, excluding the COVID, okay? Most people are on missionary trips right now, willing to sacrifice their time and their vacation. Uh, sometimes it's a young man stopping to change a tire for a elderly lady or coming out to pick one up off of the street last week. It worked really well. For those of you who don't know, it was Mark, John, and Matthew. I don't know where Luke was, but as soon as I find out, I'll let him know. But you see, that was a servant. It's a Sunday school teacher who's willing to spend their time out of, out of church, learning about what God wants their people to know, the people in their class. It's a father that takes time to play with a child. We never think of that as a servant, do we? It's a mother that teaches her daughter to cook. I can't take credit for Tanya, but I'd like to. It's a, do it's a doctor who refuses to abort a child. It's a husband who stands beside his wife when she finds out she's got cancer. And it's a wife who stands beside her husband as he goes through chemo. There are many, many forms of servants. But in the Bible, the servant was the one who brought people to Christ. Andrew already knew about repentance because that's what John the Baptist taught. How many of us repent daily? Mm-hmm. It's hard to do. You know, if you could buy me for what you, I think I'm worth and sell me for what I'm worth, you'd not get very much money. And you can turn that around, too. You can buy me for as little as I am. But you know what? Christ paid a debt. He paid for all of us. It was John the Baptist that told Andrew about the coming Lamb of God. We've got a message, people. We've got a building over here to build. We need to get out, and we need to bring people in. God's got this building. It wasn't just a, a, a thing through the wind. It is a journey that God has put us on, and we have got to begin to support that journey. And you know what part of that journey is? Is you going out and being an Andrew and bringing somebody to Christ. I can tell you without a doubt, there is no greater thing than looking at someone who has passed and know that you prepared and gave them Christ, led them to the Lord, or let them know about him. Not everybody's going to receive it. 
I know you find this difficult to believe, but sometimes when people see me coming, they run. Can't imagine that, can, can you? <laughs> but the bottom line is this. He's part of me. He's my very being. And you see, while G Andrew was learning about God from John, Peter was still fishing. Peter didn't know about it. He wasn't interested. And yet, when Andrew found out about Jesus, he said, mm, I got to find my brother. I got to get to Peter. Now, he didn't know that Peter was going to preach on Pentecost Sunday. He didn't know he was going to be full of baptism of the Holy Ghost and 3,000 was going to be added to the church. He just wanted to get him to Jesus. And he didn't know that he was going to be in Peter's shadow for the rest of Christ's ministry. But you know what? It didn't matter. I don't care whose shadow I'm in. I don't care who I'm coming behind. As long as I'm bringing people to the Lord. That's what it's all about. He wasn't wishy-washy either. He didn't go up to Peter and say, You know, brother, I've, I, I've been going to this, this, this listening to this, this man. And I'm not sure whether it would be good for you or not. But I think maybe you ought to go with me sometime. That's not what he said. He went up and he said, I've met the Messiah. I've met the Christ that they're talking about. And you need to go hear him. You need to come with me. You need to be led. You see, we need to follow what Christ said. This little girl, Chelsea, this morning, she brought three babies with her. Now, they're too young. I'll give you that. But she's an example of what we need to do. We need to be bringing people in. We need to be telling people about Christ. And you know what? Regardless of where they go, if you've told them about Christ, and if they know about salvation, then you've done what God's called us to do. You're planting seed. He was selfless. Rather than glory in the fact that Andrew was one of the first men Jesus called, and maybe reminding his brother, hey, man, hey, hey, you remember, I knew him before you did. I was there before you. I was serving at the piano before you. Are you aware of that? He didn't do that. What he did was he was just happy to have his brother on board with him. Other disciples and positions, they didn't matter to him. I want you to note this down. Make sure that your servant's talent is bigger than your ego. Make sure your servant's talent, towel, and talent is bigger than your ego. Because the first thing he did was find joy in his brother coming to Christ and discovering the call. Now, Andrew, as a brother, uh, sure was different from them brothers in Genesis, wasn't he? Cain and Abel. Remember that? Oh, yeah. Cain got jealous. You ever been jealous of somebody's ministry? You ever been jealous of what somebody else can do for the Lord? Let me tell you something. Every one of us is part of the body. We are joint, fitted jointly to supply. And there's not a person out here that couldn't be a prayer warrior. Now, you know prayer warriors takes time, don't it? you got to have a schedule. You can't just think, oh, well, today I'll pray. Well, I forgot it yesterday, but that's okay. I'll make up for it tomorrow. No. You need to have an appointed time that you meet with the master, and I'm telling you, your prayer life will be revitalized. My sister introduced me to a book called Prayer That Availeth Much, and it absolutely renewed and refreshed and revived my prayer life because when I can't pray anything else, I can open my Bible and I can pray Scripture. And oh, what a comfort when I'm hurting that I know he loves me. Oh, what a comfort when I'm in a, having to make a decision and there's nobody I can talk to about it. I can talk to him. I can listen to what he has to say. But you see, they were totally different. Now, how many times have we been in that situation? You see, really, Andrew becomes the very first missionary in the New Testament because he was the first to go to Jesus and take somebody. 
Think about it. He could have thought of himself, well, if I get Peter to join, he better know that I was here first, that Jesus picked me first. Anybody that's, and I'm preaching to us old people right now. (laughs) You know, yeah, well, okay. (laughs) But you know how we get bent out of shape when the Lord brings these new kids in? Anybody besides me ever read Titus? What's our job? It's to teach the young. It's to let them have. This morning's worship just thrilled me all over the place. I love it. Because these kids are seeking God. They are praising God. Now, I've been, I was a worship leader from the time I think I was 13 years old. I'm not sure. And somebody asked me the other day if I was on the worship team here. And I kind of chuckled. And I said, no, as a matter of fact, never have been. And they looked at me for a minute and I said, let me tell you something. God sends people younger than me that can handle that type of worship, that can handle that type of warfare. And if you don't think worship is a warfare, sometimes you need to set up here. Trust me. You need to be praying for our worship team because they fight, fight, they fight battles you don't know anything about. They fight times when they're hurt. They fight things that are said about them. Satan always has a way of making you feel inferior. And if you're not praying, you need to be. Because it's not what needs to happen in our lives. But you see, Peter emerged as one of the famous disciples. By the way, speaking of the disciples, how many of you know all 12 of them? Hmm? You know, we know about what, four or five maybe? We know Judas because he's bad. He's just bad. And we know Peter, James, and John, and we know Matthew, Mark, Luke. But do we know the rest of them? Do we know the Bartholomews and the Andrews and the Matthiases? Or do we just let them slide by? You know what I'm saying? It was not the ones that held together and wrote the books. It was the ones like Andrew that continued to bring people to Christ. He was selfless in that. He never thought about himself. He never took things for himself. He simply did what he'd heard the master say. Fish. I will make you fishers of men. Isn't that what Christ said at at the lake there? So what do you think Andrew did? He became a fisher of men. I don't know what his hook was. I don't know how personable he was. But I do know people came to him. Because his faith in, six verse, in John 6, verses 1 through 15, and 1, 7. This is our next glimpse of Andrew. You know where he's at? He's with Christ, where all these people are coming. And, and he said in verse um, 35, he was standing... And he was looking, and he was, he was expecting. And here comes all these men and women and children, and they get hungry. And he wants to feed them. And one of the disciples said, it's going to cost 200 denaro. That's a bunch of money, people, then. But what did Andrew do? He just went out among the crowd, and he found a little boy with two fishes and five loaves. And he brought him. To the disciples? No. He took him to Jesus. And he said, this isn't very much, but this is all I've found. And Jesus said, it's enough. He blessed it and breaked it. And he continued to feed. And there's Andrew again, just doing what he needs to do to help the crowd. You see, everybody else saw it as impossible, didn't they? But not Andrew. Finding someone to bring to Jesus was all he'd ever done. And that's what he needed to do. So he recognized the inadequacy of that, but he had enough faith to look for it. How many times have you had faith to look for an answer that didn't make sense to you? Or do something that didn't make sense to you? When the Lord said, I'll take care of this. I'll do this. You see that 
picture that building over there? Does, is it just me? Does it make sense that God would call a congregation of, what, 60 people to build a $150,000 building? Does that make sense to anybody? But that's what God has called us to do. So we've got to believe and have faith that it's going to happen. Why? Because the Holy Spirit overshadows that. The Holy Spirit is leading and guiding if we'll take hold and trust the Lord. I was praying in January, and I said, Lord, what can I do? And he told me an amount to give for the year. I said, Lord, that's not very much. And you know what he said? Little is much when God is in it. All we've got to do is be obedient. All we've got to do is have the faith to believe that he will supply. I don't have a big savings account. I don't have any savings account. Well, I think I got $5 in a savings account somewhere. But I don't have a savings account. And I don't have somebody paying my bills. But I have a God that sees to every need I have. I have a God that is a comforter. I have a God that brings forth when people hurt me. He wraps me up and he holds me and the Holy Spirit overshadows me. And there is a peace that passes all understanding. Why? Because of my faith in him. I don't understand it and you won't understand it. But I'm here to tell you God is faithful. He was faithful to Andrew he was faithful in what he did for him and besides that there was 12 baskets left after they all ate does that number ring a bell in anybody's head how many disciples were there 12 and how many baskets what do you think everybody had a basket everybody had what they needed sometimes we forget the little things we want God to do the big things. But I think the real hero is that little boy who gave up his lunch, thinking, all these people, and they're going to eat my lunch, and I'm not going to get any. There's a, a, a Southern Gospel song out right now about that. I love it. And his mother leave the house, and they're going to the meeting, and she packs him this little lunch, and they get there. And they sit down, and all of a sudden, here comes Andrew to take that lunch to the master. And he gets home. Mommy, did you see what they did with my lunch? What do you think we're teaching our kids when we talk about doom and gloom? What do you think we're teaching these young people without faith to know that God will supply? You see, Andrew was used to finding the solution, though he couldn't see how it was going to work out. He didn't know when he brought Peter to Christ that he was going to be a preacher. He didn't know when he took that lunch to Jesus that he was going to be able to feed all those people and the wives and the, and the children. Everybody got to eat. You see, it was an Andrew that was always looking to bring a someone to him, to Christ. When you find somebody and you need to lead them to Christ, lead them to Christ. Don't try and give them your philosophy and don't treat them to a denomination. Take them to the Bible and let God work it out. Show them Christ in your walk. James said something to me last week that has stuck with me. And I asked him a question. He gave me an answer. And then he looked at me and he said, and the important thing is that they love Jesus. That's the important thing, that they love Jesus. You see, Jesus asked his board members, the disciples, to give out the little they had taken in and believe that if used for ministry, it will be multiplied to meet the entire need. Is that not a good lesson for a church board? That God will supply and that he will bring forth what he wants to bring forth and how he wants to use it. And I've got to hurry because I'm only on page six and I've got 18 of them. Okay. There will uh, always be a Philip who says, but we don't have it. Does anybody besides me know the definition of faith? Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We don't see it in our natural man. But you know what we do? We live in our natural man, don't we? And we got to take the blinders off of our eyes. You see, God takes care of it. God 
Give us men and women like Andrew who, when faced with the impossible, look for a solution through Christ. Look for a solution in what God wants to do. It says it was a bright, sunny day years ago in Niagara Falls, and there was a uh, tightrope walker that was going to walk across it. And he did. He got ready. He went across. And then he walked back over on the other side. And he asked the people, he said, uh, okay, you've seen me do that. Now, who believes I can take them over on my back? Nobody. Finally, one young man said, I believe you can do it. I'm going to go with you. Now, he's on a tightrope across Niagara Falls. For those of you who've never been there, man, there is there a wind up there on that falls. But anyway, he went. And when he climbed on his back, he said, to the thrill of the crowd, we'll make it. Why? Because he had faith in that tightrope walker. Do you have faith in your tightrope walk, tight walker? I can't even get it out. Who is our tightrope walker? Jesus. Who is in charge of that building right there? Jesus. Who is going to see it come to fruition? Jesus. And we need Andrews to cause that to happen. We need Andrews to come and do what needs to be done with this building. And then... In John 12, verses 20 and 22, we find Andrew and Philip at the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. They're about done. And Philip seems to be Philip, the practical one. And several of his Greek friends came and wanted to ask him questions. And, and Philip wasn't real sure what to do. So who do you think he went to? He went to Andrew. Andrew knew what and they probably came to him because I guess Philip is a Greek name I didn't know that but these were the Greeks that had rejected Judaism should they be allowed to see Jesus on a busy day should we allow people who have rejected him to see Jesus on a busy day on a Sunday when we're having church and we're busy Andrew took him he didn't care how busy he was he took him them to Jesus because he is still Andrew. He doesn't go to Jesus with the problem by himself. He brings Philip and the Greeks. Why? Because they all needed to hear it. Judging by the statement that Jesus gives in 1232, it's quite possibly indicates the presence of a Gentile Greek as Jesus spoke here. Thus, Andrew must have gone and got these Greeks and brought them to Jesus exactly the way we would expect it. When I can't tell you, when you don't know your Bible, don't make something up. For goodness sake, do a research. Check out a word. Call the pastor. Call me. Call somebody that knows the word when you're just not sure. Because what we say and what we tell them, we're going to be held accountable for. Think about it. It's so important. But you see, he just still didn't fill the role that his brother Peter did. He still didn't fill the role, but he doesn't show any jealousy. He is just so happy to point people to Jesus. Are we happy to point people to Jesus? It says a certain king needed a faithful servant and had to choose between two men in his court. He decided on a plan to find out which one would be the best servant to fill the office. So he hired both men at the same wage to go out and draw water from this well to pour into a wicker basket. What happens when you pour water in a wicker basket? It leaks. That's what it does. He told them he would return that night to see how they were doing. And after dumping a couple of buckets of water into this wicker basket, the one servant said the obvious. This is crazy. We pour water into this basket that simply can't hold water, and this is a waste of time and energy because the water just runs through the sides of the basket. You ever told God that it was 
just a waste of your time to be doing this? Have you ever been in studying your Bible and you think, man, I'm not getting anything from this word today. I'm not messing with this. And right down below it, there's a nugget that you're going to miss. It says, the other servant, however, kept up the useless job of drawing the water from the well, and he kept pouring it into the basket, only to have it drain out, but he kept doing it. And the other servant said, you're really going to keep doing this? Anybody ever said to you, you go keep praying for this? I mean, it's been 25 years. Why are you still praying about it? Have you ever had anybody say that to you? Or have you just said to yourself, I'm quitting. I'm not praying for them anymore. You know what happens? You miss a nugget. Anyway, that one does, that wasn't didn't want to do it, decided he was going to leave. And the other responded back. That he said, the one that was leaving said, I'm not going to do such fool's work. Whoa. Anybody ever tell you when you're working with young people you're crazy? And you're doing fool's work if you're a missionette? or a ranger leader, and you got kids crawling all over you, going crazy. Anybody ever tell you, you're a fool to do this? Sometimes. Nevertheless, though, the master, the one that wanted to draw the water, he kept drawing the water. And as the master returned that night, and he brought up his last bucket of water, in the bottom of it was a diamond ring. Now, if that diamond ring had have shown before, the wicker basket would have allowed it to slip away. But that last bucket of water was sealed. That last bucket of water held the jewel. That last time you go, that last time you reach, that last time you press through, you will find the treasure. You will see it. And we need to continue to seek no matter, no matter what is in there, God has a plan. You see, he got the place of honor. He got the good thing. So, do you know that the name of Andrew means strength? It really means manly. So, he's not a wimp. He knows how to bring people to Christ. But he is the unrecognized strength of the disciples. Bringing people to Christ. The famed Dr. David Livingstone in Africa was preaching Christ. And he got a letter from the society that said to him, Where are you? If so, we want to send other men to join me. Join you. And they were quite jolted, however, by the response they got from Dr. Livingstone. What do you think he said? If you have men who will come only if they know there is a good road, I don't want them. I want men who will still come if there's no road at all. Christ is looking for Andrews that will go out into the world one-on-one -on -one and witness for him. And we've all got that ability. Do you realize that you'll see ten people in your life to present Christ to that nobody else will see. That's a statistic. It's probably less now. But think of that. Ten people that you present Christ to. Are you doing that? Have you done that? Because it takes a real man or woman to serve Christ. I'd like to tell you it's been an easy 62 years. But I'd be lying through my teeth. It has not been. But we always need to be willing to bring someone. Andrew certainly wasn't the most popular disciple. But he was the one that continued to bring people to Christ. He was always willing to do. And these things happened in, in between times and all that other stuff. But the bottom line is this. Andrew wasn't among the three who witnessed the transfiguration on, in Matthew 17, verses 1 through 21. Andrew wasn't there when Jesus raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. That's in Mark 5, 21 through 43. Andrew wasn't handpicked to follow Jesus further into Gethsemane. That's in Mark 14, 32, 42. 
So how might the carnal side have reacted? How would we have reacted? Well, bless God, they didn't ask me to come to that silver and gold luncheon, and I ain't going. When everybody's welcome. It has nothing <laughs> It has nothing to do with who you reach and who you don't reach. If it's up there in, in the announcements, you're welcome. You're welcome. You don't need an invitation. We need to learn that we can't live with bitterness and wrath and, and anger and clamor and slander and malice. That's in Ephesians 4.31. It's all got to be given away. I love the way Izzy sings, but I'll never sing like Izzy for a couple of reasons, but we won't go into those. But anyway, I love the way that Abby plays the piano, but I'll never play a piano like that. I play at my house, and the Lord and I have a really good time, but he don't care when I hit the wrong key. And neither do I, because I just keep singing until I find the right one. But it's okay. You see, we have to stop the jealousy, because Andrew is an example to us. You don't know what God is going to do with that person you're praying for, that that person you're bringing to. I, I listen to Diana on, on my Facebook. I love it when she plays. I sing with her. But I can't play like that. But I can still enjoy it. I can still worship the Lord. We have got to get to where we are willing to worship the Lord. Well, most of you who know me know my favorite verse, Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things, that means everything comes in your life. That means when you are hurt. That means when you are happy. That means when you are sad. That means when you are angry. If we will allow it, all things work together for good to those that underline the word love God. And I'm not talking about a physical word slinging love. I'm talking about an action love. I'm talking about a love that says, God, regardless of what comes, I will serve you. Lord, regardless of how much I hurt, I will be at the cross bearing my burdens. I don't care who said what. And I'm telling you, there are times that family will hurt you more than you ever want to be hurt. But I still go to Calvary, and I still pray for their salvation. Why? Because that's my job. I don't care how hard you hurt, and I've been hurt lots. Uh, time from... 1982 to probably 1999, very few of my family spoke to me, let alone came around me. But that's okay. I took them to Calvary. You see, that's what it's all about. Who have been called according to his purpose. You find this amazing, but your purpose really, that you think you have, really doesn't matter. God's got, a, God's got a purpose for you. And if you seek him, he'll use that talent you have to build up his body. He'll use that talent to, to bring you to him. And, and let me tell you something. He knows exactly who will be an Andrew. And he knows exactly who's going to gripe and complain. I could go back several years sitting in front of that choir swear, and this is the last time I do this. I don't say that anymore. <laughs> I used to pray, Lord, send somebody to do this. You know what? Ain't nobody showed up yet. I know. But you know what? When they do, it's okay because God's planning it. I, I've got about 25 years, maybe 30 if I live to be 105, and I probably am going to, so I can aggravate everybody, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, but we can, we can serve and teach and move over when God says, I want to use them. And then you can be a support and teach them. You don't need to be center stage because, you see, God wants you and me to be conformed. He wants us to be reshaped molded into his, the image of Jesus. But before we can become like him, we got to know what he's like. We got to know what he's like. We got to have the mind of Christ. How many people like to read? Oh, I love it. So those of you that don't, it has to be tough for you to read the word, right? <laughs> I have a sister that has that problem. 
And every once in a while, I get a call and says, Lorley, have you read this? And I said, yeah. She said, well, will you tell me what you're thinking? And I said, no, but once you read it, we'll discuss it. She knows exactly what she's asking me. But you know what? When she sits down to study the Bible, she begins to love to read. Now, she doesn't read stories like I do, and she doesn't read books like I do. But when you put the Bible in her hands, her heart is a heart of love. Lord, I'm going to do what I don't like to do to support. I'm going to do what you called me to do. Because Mark 10.45 says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Again, remember when he tied the towel around his waist at the Last Supper, and he washed their feet. Make sure that your servant's towel is bigger than your ego. Because if Jesus bowed and washed feet, then we need to be willing to bow and wash feet too. Whether we're doing it in the natural or in the spiritual. Because you see, to measure Andrew's success, it was serving and giving. It was not being served and getting. Now I have discovered with this white hair, every time I go to a grocery or to a store, Everybody wants to help me out with my groceries. And I'm going, no, I think I can get to the car and put them in the back. They're not that heavy. And then I think to myself, well, who do you think is going to take them out when I get home? You know? But there's a, there's a need to help people. <laughs> so what are you after? And how will you measure up in what is ready if the worship team wants to come and join me as I finish. You see, Andrew's gift was that of a middleman or second fiddle. Have you ever heard the words play in second fiddle? Mm-hmm. We all have. You see, he was the helper in the group, acting as a bridge, acting on what God would have him do. Now, he connected his brother Peter to Jesus and then stayed in the backdrop while Peter grew more prominent than he. He brought people to Jesus while the others taught by the word, he taught by example. The church still needs middlemen, those who can speak by action and not just words. And those who knew how to lead others to Christ. Are you and Andrew? Stand with me, please. Oh, Father God, we come before you with praise and thanksgiving in our hearts. And Lord, I pray, Lord, that this word has found a resting place in hearts. That, Lord, we will have a church of Andrews, willing, Lord, to go to that person, willing to bring them in. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to draw closer to you. Help us, Lord, to be willing to be used of you and do what you say do when you say do it. Lord, not looking to the left or the right, not caring what anybody says, knowing, God, that you know our hearts, knowing, God, that we are doing what you've called us to do. Help us, Lord, to let the oil of the Holy Spirit just saturate us so when darts come and when things fall on us and we hear things that hurt us, Lord, just let it roll off with the oil of the Holy Spirit. Just let it be based in you. Father, serving you, bringing others to you. As we close, Lord, I pray that your will will be done. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you all join me up here, please? As we get ready to sing this song, it's a prayer. It's, it's called Jesus Use Me. And as you sing it, let your heart be turned toward him. Using it, Lord, as a, as a, as a declaration that you're willing to give the Lord your heart. Jesus, use me. Oh, Lord, don't refuse me. For surely there's a work that I can do. And even though it's humble, Lord, help my will.
Jesus, though death may come my way, I'll spread the gospel to the fallen Surely there's a work that I can do. And even though it's humble, Lord, help my will to crumble. Though the cost be great, I'll work for you. Peace of lily of the valley, the bride and He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He's a beautiful rose to Sharon. He's all the world to me. Oh, the best of all. He He is is my my coming king. King. Yes. Oh, yes. So, Jesus, yes, Lord. Surely there's a work that I can do. And even though it's humble, Lord, help my will to crumble. Though the cross be great, I'll work for you. So Jesus, use me, oh Lord, don't. Sister Lily, for bringing that word to us today. Let's close in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for the word that was brought today, Lord Jesus. We just pray, Lord God, that it will not leave us today, Lord God, that we would take it home, we would meditate upon it, study it, Lord God, apply it to our lives, Lord Jesus, I pray, Lord God. Just touch us as we go throughout our week, Lord God, doing our everything things, Lord Jesus, that you would just shine through us, Lord God, that we would be a witness to somebody that has never heard of you, Lord God. Just touch us all, I pray, Lord God. Thank you for a great service today, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.